Hi, everyone. Uh, audio check. Can you guys hear me? Maybe? Yeah, sounds good. Perfect. Thank you very much. So this is the second part. This is going to be the more exotic uh, conversation. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just get going here. If whoever wants to watch this later, we will, I'll put it up on YouTube again. So unlike the other part, this part I um, oh, let me get back. This. So my motivation for this is uh, kind of the, we are all, the way I think about this, we are all kind of stuck on a big spacecraft called the Earth. And hopefully we have to understand how to operate the, the planet so we can live on it for as long as we can um, and kind of experience the craziness of the universe. Uh, we might move to another spacecraft at some point, but hopefully keep this one going because it's, uh, it's the best we have. And I don't think there's uh, any other spacecraft around us that has the same features as this one. Um, OK, that's kind of the <laughs> why I'm doing it. Again, reminder, look at the bottom of the slide. They don't have references. So um, hopefully those references are going to provide more information about what, I, what I'm talking. This is the schedule or what I was going to talk about. So I'm going to start with, I think, a very interesting topic to me. Uh, what, what is money? Because uh, we use it every day. And I don't know how many people actually know how money is created and uh, like how to think about it. Or I don't know how to think about it, but I have a few different perspectives. And each one kind of uh, highlights the different aspects of what money is. I'm going to talk a bit of why I think it's useful to invest your money into the market. And also talk about why it's probably not useful to invest your money in the market and kind of leave it at that. Uh, all right, so there we go. First thing, uh, I don't, in today's world, I'm not sure how many people are still using banknotes. Uh, this is a fairly archaic monetary system. The interesting part here is they have this note on them that says this is not, uh, this note is legal tender. And this is in for a bill from 2006. And I think all the newer bills have this note. Uh, I actually was around when there were some bills that looked like this. This is a slightly older bill. There were some still in circulation uh, a while ago. And the same note now says something like, uh, this note is legal tender for all debts. And if you look at this part, it says, this note is redeemable in lawful money. And normally you would think like, wait a second, what, what like, isn't this lawful money? What is this <laughs> if this is not lawful money? Uh, going back kind of in history, so this is the 1950s, we're going to look at the 1920s bill. So this one says that it's redeemable in gold on demand at the United States treasuries or in gold or lawful money, again, lawful money at any Federal Reserve banks. And then this was kind of, I think it's in 1923. Um, this was a $100,000 bill. You can see that they explicitly call out um, that this is uh, payable to bearer on demand but it's, it's, in, it's $100,000 in gold. The other interesting thing for me is uh, if you look at these bills, uh, well, this one doesn't have it, the 2006 one, but the other ones have. They have this stamp, and this is the stamp that re refers to which Federal Reserve Bank issued the bill. So this is the New York Federal Reserve. This other one uh, is the bank of, this is the Chicago Federal Reserve. So I think there's seven Federal Reserves or eight in the United States. Uh, and each one can issue uh, banknotes. Um, okay, so it seems like the money that they are talking about back in the day was uh, was related to coin coinage. Uh, so this was then coinage was denominated either in uh, gold or silver. Um, the the breakdown between the money being uh, reflecting the, these banknotes reflecting uh, real gold and like gold reserves and or silver reserves kind of occurred sometimes around, I think, the Civil War in the 1860s. And that's when uh, I think the, the term greenback came about. Uh, uh, the, the Northerners, I guess, I'm not very good at US history, they printed these notes uh, that they were using as money to reflect the gold that they had in deposits. And they actually printed more than the deposit they had. Uh, and then I uh, guess in the, the, these, these notes became kind of, they, they got into circulation, they were being used by people during the Civil War. And at some point, uh, I think after the Civil War, they were still in circulation. And some, some people were interested in, okay, I'm gonna uh, give back my notes and I want real gold in return. 
And I think this is this, this is a, a, a person, I can't remember what he was selling. It was something to do with hay or some, some, some farming product. And he went to one of these Federal Reserves and he said, okay, I, on the Federal Reserve, he said that it's redeemable in law for money. I want gold back. And the Federal Reserve said, oh, we can't give you any gold. And there was a lawsuit. And then the judge upheld the, the, the government side and said, okay, no, these, this is legal tender and you can't get gold on it it's, uh, on every demand it. Uh, and then again, kind of this came back in the 1970s, again, kind of some, some, some other person tried to say, I want my gold back. Uh, and the US, the, the, yeah, I think just the, another lawsuit and this kind of solidified idea that, okay, you will never get your gold back. Um, and so the transition from um, money that was backed by physical assets to this fiat money that was just a bank note being printed. Um, the, it is a, it, to me, it's fairly interesting to kind of look at the history and how we got to Bitcoin and whatnot. Uh, but um, so as I was talking about, like in the 1860s, uh, be, before 1860s, each bank, so I think there were hundreds of maybe thousands, maybe more than that, tens of thousands of banks around the United States in the up to like the 19, 1900s. And each one was uh, issuing its own banknotes that were reflected in the amount of gold they actually held in their safes. Um, in the 1860s, kind of the US government said, okay, you know what, instead of each bank having its own bank notes, we'll have a standard and this, these are the notes issued by the US government. Uh, in 1934, during the recession, kind of people were actually transitioning away from using bank notes from issued by the US government, they're going back to using gold in order to maintain uh, the monetary structure, I guess, of the United States, the country itself. Uh, the government uh, decreed that everybody should surrender all their privately held gold. And this was a big outrage in 1930s. And they paid them back kind of on a one-to-one. -one, and we hear you get a $1. There was some rate of exchange between gold and US dollars. And this was supposedly gonna stay fixed. Um, it didn't. Um, there was World War II, uh, kind of the US dollar became the, what was called the reserve currency, which meant that all the gold, mo most of the gold in the world would be held in big safes in somewhere in uh, Fort Knox, for example, they have all this, I don't know, tons, maybe hundreds of tons of gold. And then the countries themselves, so France and Germany and Britain and whoever else, they would have kind of a, a, through the US dollar, they would have a stake on that gold. So they'd be like, well, I'm holding a million dollars worth of US dollars, which is equivalent to a million dollars worth of gold in the Knox Preserve, so I know that as France myself, if I ever want my gold back, I'll go to the United States and be like, hey, here's $10 million, give me back the gold. Um, so I think France actually did try that in the 1970s. Uh, and the US, the government said, well, we won't pay you back any gold. And this is when, this is the Nixon shock uh, where uh, Nixon said, the, the US dollar is no longer pegged to the gold and the gold is gonna stay with us. If you guys want money back, here's more US dollars. Uh, so now it's all, everything kind of, the, 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 all the currencies started floating. Before the currencies were tethered down to gold, the amount of gold in the world, and now through the US dollars, and now everything kind of just started fluctuating. It was, uh, it was just kind of the, the currencies would fluctuate amongst each other. So you'd have, okay, how much US dollars am I gonna pay for, uh, I don't know, the, the French for probably the franc or something. Uh, or how much US dollars I'm going to pay to the, um, for a British pound. And this is, this is very interesting. There's some documentaries out there and you can see kind of when that happened in 1971, there were all these different banks and all of a sudden you had like, uh, everything was floating and everybody was calling each other, hey, how much are you paying for the British pound? Oh, okay, I'm going to pay this much on all of it. And you get foreign exchange um, trading and whatnot. And that kind of developed on its own. Um, more recently, I guess in 2009, you have all these, um, Cryptocurrencies, which is another interesting term. All these, these um, banknotes are being printed by the Federal Reserve. The coins themselves are actually printed by the Treasury. So the US has a fairly interesting structure. We have both the Treasury and the Federal Reserves, and which are fairly different, different entities. Um, when I'm talking about Bitcoin here, this is a digital form of money. The, the Treasury itself in, in the United States, and I guess in Canada would be the Bank of Canada, they are thinking about printing or minting their own digital currencies. And this is 
a central bank backed digital currency, which is different than, than, than Bitcoin, which is kind of not minted by, it's minted kind of, is, a, is an exercise in math kind of a process. Looking back further, so this was kind of the last hundred years. Uh, this, and this gives me an idea of a, how, how was the money, money originally used? Um, so I, the, the, and the, the, there's some really good books on this. Uh, um, I didn't put it here, but the David Graeber, he's kind of an anarcho-capitalist type of um, author. So he, he wrote a, a lot of interesting books on this. So he's an anthropologist by education. And then he did a lot of research on what, what is money and how does it kind of fit into our social structures. And yeah, so there's, there's all kinds of type of what we consider money to begin with. And they were just methods of accounting for your real assets. Um, this is a, the Bula is an interesting one. It's a, you'll have all these little clay spheres that would represent, okay, a sheep or some, some other assets that he had. And you put them in a bigger sphere and you would give that to someone and be like, okay, I'm going to take, you have these assets, these representations of my assets and I'm going to take the assets and whenever you come back and you give me this representation, I'll have to give it back the assets. Uh, fairly interesting. Um, I think the Chinese actually had the first coinage um, that they were issuing. Uh, a lot of times uh, you would have these, these, these gold mint, the gold coins, but uh, with time they would, people would shave off the edges to make more gold. So you never know exactly how much gold you have. Fairly interesting kind of usage of money. Um, this is actually a really cool one uh, in, in, I think in somewhere in the Southeast Asia. Um, on some islands, uh, the idea of having money wasn't really about how, how easy it is to transport it. They would just have something that's very hard to replicate and we'd use that as the money. And they, you're using these huge stones as, as the concept of money. So the, the, rich, the richest in the whatever social structure they had there, maybe a village or something or an island, they would have, okay, I own that big coin. And it's gonna, you know, it's in the middle of the village, and that's mine. And everybody would know that that's yours. And if you were trade to trade with someone, you'd just say, okay, I'm gonna give you a quarter of that or something. And now everybody else knew that this other person has a quarter of it. The interesting story here is that um, yeah, big big coin. Um, this this is this coin. If you go to the Bank of Canada and I guess on, I don't know Ottawa, they have a, one of these coins. Uh, they actually transported it from the, one of those islands to Canada because they were no longer using them. So they were just kind of breaking down. The interesting part is they want, at one point, they were moving one of these huge coins in a boat from one island to another, and the boat sank. But everybody knew that there was a coin there. And it's like, oh, okay, it's sitting at the bottom of the ocean over there, and it's owned by that guy. <laughs> so they could still trade with that coin because the entire social system was still recognizing that coin as is valuable and it's, they knew that, yeah, it's still there at the bottom of the ocean. Um, so you can see how this, the, 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 from, from going from kind of concrete uh, representation of assets, you're going to more abstract representation. You actually don't need to see it. You just know that it's, it's kind of like a public ledger. Everybody in their mind knows that, okay, that, that person has it. This is this kind of how I think about the different roles of money. So it, 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 in a very, very simple way, it's a unit of accounting of your assets. Uh, you can use it once you account for those assets instead of exchange the assets themselves you can exchange the money that assets represent so it's also a unit of exchange At some point you can use it as a unit of storage and this to me is um, so storage of value this to me is kind of a strange one because if you i'm just thinking like value is a depending on what you are trying to assess with it is much more volatile so if you if i'm trying to say okay i have it's uh, the end of autumn or the beginning of autumn. I have harvested my, all my apples. I have 10 tons of apples. And I, the, the value of the apples fresh is this. So I'm going to say this is my, how much money I have. Uh, I don't know, two years passed by. My, I sold some of the apples. Others have gone rotten. My, my value has, has decreased in certain ways. So it's, money itself is, it won't go bad, but certain type of assets will. So the, the reflection of the value, underlying value to the money I, I'm holding is not very direct. Um, and then I, I'm going to talk about much more interesting is kind of the ability of money to compress information. And this is, this is kind of the quintessential example here. Let me try to get to the yeah. So this is a quintessential example that was is used by economists. And uh, I think it came about in around 1980s. 
Uh, and this is Milton Friedman. I don't know how many of you guys heard of Milton Friedman. He's, he was this economist. Have you guys heard of uh, Atlas Shrugged in Rand? Oh, yeah, um, like true capitalism. Yeah, true capitalism kind of down for, So Milton Friedman was kind of in, in that Austrian school of economics, one of the big uh, representative of that, that current. And the, the point he's trying to make here is nobody really knows what the value of a pencil is because nobody understands how to make a pencil. There's not one person in the world that you can tell them, okay, make me a pencil. Uh, unless they have access to our per particular economy kind of market and the, our current situation, they would be unable to build a pencil, even though you think that the pencil is a very simple uh, concept. And this is, this is what I was trying to capture here with this poorly drawn diagram of mine. To build a pencil, I actually, there's a book called uh, The Pencil. I didn't, I put it probably somewhere in the references. Um, you need to have access to a lot of different industries. And if you think about kind of when you, when you try to price a pencil, I need to keep track of how much uh, energy and kind of useful resources were used and kind of labor was put into, I don't know, getting for, uh, there's this, uh, on the pencil, there's a ferrule and this is where the eraser kind of gets put in that's made of aluminum. So you need to understand, okay, how much money do I need to pay for a ferrule for the aluminum? And unless you have, some method of conveying that information from the point where the ore is mined to all the way to the point where somebody sells you a ferrule. And this is just for the ferrule, for the eraser. They can, you can see how this is, this might be happening, I don't know, in Northern Canada, this might be happening in Brazil or somewhere. This might be happening, I don't know, in somewhere else. So this is, this is tying kind of a global production system together through like and the money is kind of the unit that's uh, the unit the informational unit that's being passed on throughout throughout the system to be able to tell you okay this is how much how many resources i'm i'm i think were used to uh, generate this idea this this pencil in reality and it is very interesting i think dylan had an interesting point where it's like how do you guys think about well i can go with canadian dollars to new zealand and I'm gonna use Canadian dollars and purchase an ice cream in New Zealand. How does that money that I was, I was kind of, I got, I earned in Canada, transfer the whatever resources I got paid for in, for creating in Canada to New Zealand. And the, the, there's a network and sometimes it's Canadian dollars. Sometimes it has to kind of convert from Canadian dollars to US dollars, from US dollars to New Zealand dollars, or maybe directly. And all that information, it's, it's kind of a, a an information structure, money is kind of an information structure that allows you to synchronize different processes in the world to be, allow you to exchange goods. Uh, so that, that was kind of my, oh yeah, okay, the money is a very interesting concept because normally I would just think about it as, okay, accounting unit uh, or medium of exchange or storage of value, but right now I'm kind of, okay, it's an information tool. So, and I guess yep. that's, that's why people were very uncomfortable with leaving the gold standards because the gold standard was something comfortable where it's, this dollar is worth this amount of gold. Yeah. And that has some intrinsic value. Because so I'm, I'm realizing that um, they probably didn't put it here. There's an interesting point that you brought up and I, I should probably make it in, um, here, let me switch back to the other slides I had. Remember when I, uh, when I was talking about uh, here about this plot, this plot. Mm -hmm. um, so just imagine the amount, the, reserve, the amount of gold you had in your economy and the goal you made gold is you have to go mine. And in the beginning, maybe it was easier to mine uh, because I don't know you just go with a pan on a river and it was just <laughs> lying there. Now you need like big mining uh, kind of facilities to mine it. Uh, the, the economy itself, the value of the economy is gonna, it's more or less kind of growing exponentially. It's a, at a slow rate, but it's exponential. The, the amount of gold you mine, it's probably de it's plateauing. Like you, it's gonna become harder and harder to mine gold. So if you think about this, if you are to stay on the gold standard, this curve would actually look the exactly opposite. The, the amount of money you would have is gonna plateau, the economy value is gonna increase. So the blue curve would start going above this, this amount of money you have in the economy and everything would be deflationary where it would mean that if I hold on to my gold, the value of that gold with respect to the, what the value of the economy is, because there's not more, the, the, the rate of the growth of gold uh, assets in the world is slower than the rate of uh, growth of the economy. That means that gold is going to become more precious. So the there was this, this, there's this idea that um, if you stay on the gold standard, and this is what Britain did in uh, in 
after the Great uh, Depression in the 1920s, they were like, okay, we'll stay on the gold standard because that's kind of the safe way to go. And while the United States kind of switched. So every, the, the, the problem they had was nobody was going to invest their gold uh, because they're like, well, if I don't, if I just hold to it, onto it, I know that its value is going to grow. Why would I kind of risk it in investments? And so in a way, moving off the gold standard allows the economy to grow in step with hopefully the, the amount of money that's being printed. And if you stay, if you maintain those curves kind of to be at the same growth level, you'll neither have an inflationary nor a deflationary environment. And, and your dollar value will stay roughly equivalent, equivalent. to a dollar of value is in your economy. And I don't know how this works exactly. One, I don't know sure how many people are interested in this, but Japan actually does a really good job at maintaining their, their parity between the value of the economy and the amount of yen kind of out there in, in circulation. Because if you, I, I know, if you go to, if you went to Japan in the 1990s, you still use the same kind of $500, 500 yen coin. Yeah, I go to Japan now, it's still $500, 500 yen coin. And it's, it's, they still have those kind of, like, if are you look they, at- Are they like collecting and dispersing money as their value goes up? Uh, no, they've been printing money, <laughs> right? So they've been trying to get the inflation going for 30 years now. And they haven't had a good, I mean, maybe now it started all of a sudden, but they, they didn't, they, they couldn't get that going. Yeah, let me, let me, I'll go through how money is printed in, in uh, or how money is created in the United States. And this is probably going to be reflected in how money is uh, printed in a lot of, or created in a lot of Western countries. Um, so this is, this is the cycle. This is, I think, a really cool uh, way. If I ask you, how, how, how do you get a hundred dollar bill? How does it, how do you conjure up a hundred dollar bill? Uh, I don't know how many people know about this cycle. So to me, it was very interesting when I learned it. So the, it all starts with uh, Congress passing a budget. In the budget, they say, okay, we have to spend this much money. And some of that money comes from collecting taxes, but it's, it's the amount of they collect is kind of, it doesn't matter. We can talk about why we need taxing, uh, but it's, it's a different conversation. They, they pass a budget and they say, okay, I need, I need to build a bridge and that bridge is gonna cost a billion dollars. To get that money, I'm gonna uh, uh, issue a bill, a bond, and that bond is gonna be nominal value a billion dollars. That bond, so the issue, the Congress passes this bill and then the bill says, I'm gonna issue a bond. That bond goes to the treasury. The treasury actually prints out the bond. Okay, it says a billion dollars. And the treasury sells the bond to the Federal Reserve. And by selling it, the Federal Reserve just prints out a billion dollars and says, here treasury, take a billion dollars and use this billion dollars as Congress mandated you to start building that bridge. The treasury takes the billion dollars and goes out to companies and be like, okay, here's a billion dollars, go out and build me the bridge. So it, it gives that billion dollars that it received from the Federal Reserve to the public to go build that bridge. Uh, the bridge gets built, people get paid. Uh, the money that the $1 billion now is in private people's hands. They take that money and put deposit, most people deposit it in, in banks, commercial banks. Now there's this interesting, so there's, there's a few cycles here. There's this cycle where people put their money in the banks, commercial banks, and then the banks loan that money back to the public. The banks can also put that billion dollars that they receive from the public, they, they deposit to the Federal Reserve and the Federal Reserve pays them some interest on it. It's kind of a tricky bit. The, the crazy part is banks can, if, they, if you give them a billion dollars, they can loan out more than a billion dollars. And this is, this is the idea of the banks have to hold, up, hold some reserves, which were a percentage of the money that people would deposit to them. So if you deposit a billion dollars and the reserve ratio was 10%, you could issue $9 billion in new money. So you, you care, the Federal Reserve creates new money and also the banks themselves create new money, commercial banks. The way that new money is being created by commercial banks is I go to the bank and say, hey, I want a mortgage for my house. The house is gonna be a million dollars. I'm gonna need a million dollars. I put down a deposit of $100,000 and the bank more or less just out of thin air prints out $900,000 and gives it to you. And that $900,000 until recently had to be backed by some $100,000 that you would have to deposit to the bank. This is kind of the, the cycle. So the banks can uh, create money, the commercial banks can create money out of kind of thin air and the Federal Reserve creates money out of thin air. As long as that money somehow gets translated into real value, so a house, a factory, 
uh, school, a casino, something that actually you can assign value to it. And that money that was lent out is matched by creating these assets. The value, the underlying value of the economy matches the amount of money that's being out, issued out there. And you don't get either inflation or deflation. If you print more money, then you actually get to uh, creating value. Or if the value, let's say there's a war and all of a sudden, in fact, I don't know, all the entire cities are getting erased and the money's still in circulation, whatever remains in assets out there, their value is going to increase. So you'll pay more money on them. So you have inflation. One, one tricky bit that's, that really threw me off. I thought I understood this until this thing happened. And I'm like, I have no idea what's going on. So until 2020, the fractional reserve lending, the way it was working was, I think on the first 100 million, you had to have, hold back 3% reserves. Uh, on the next 600 million, you had to hold back, uh, and this, uh, sorry, from there on, you had to hold back 10% um, reserves. In 2020, which was different than, it had nothing to do with COVID. The Federal Reserve actually had planned this before. The, the reserve ratio dropped down to zero which means that commercial banks don't have to hold back any reserves. Um, and I don't understand how this means that the commercial banks can, can now they can print infinite money. What, what's, what's stopping them from doing that? And my understanding is there's this modern monetary theory concept an entire kind of school of thought that somehow says, look, the, the amount of money that's being printed out there, it can still be under control. Uh, through different means. So interest rates, I, I, I don't understand exactly how this works. If you guys want to follow someone who I think might understand someone, some, some of this work, it's the Strohan Gray, who's, uh, I think he's working with the US government on these concepts. He's got a, he's a very colorful cal character. So I was talking, you, telling you guys yesterday. So he was a music teacher. <laughs> he became a social worker. He's a, he's a very, active social kind of he wants social justice kind of spread throughout the social society at large um, and then he became a lawyer so he went to law school and then he became a, a professor of finance and economics at the i'm not sure which university and now he's kind of doing it he's advising the u.s government on monetary policy and he's a he's a big uh, or to me it's kind of it's a very clear and his understanding of one of the monetary theory and his very strong ideas about it there's a few other in, interesting people um, so, it has it, been zero. And the, the Federal Reserve, I, I went on their web page, on their, on their website, and they have a, a blurb of why it's zero, but I didn't understand why. It was like, okay, so, you guys just say so the zero. The idea behind this uh, fractional reserve is, is it's a way of limiting how exactly. much money outside of the, the government-made bills is created it's by, created by the, banks. By private banks. And yeah. now they're just like, yeah. yeah as so long as you're creating value with exactly money that. that you print, we don't care. We don't care. So and I, but there, there's still there's a that you, you need to somehow maintain this tight relationship between the underlying value of the assets in, in your society and the amount of money you're printing because otherwise you'll have these either inflation goes crazy you'll kind of reach Weimar Republic in the 1920s in Germany or you'll get deflation yeah yeah or yeah so there's there's all kinds of different problems here um, but yeah so this is this is kind of how money is being made and we, to me it was, this was I think it was around 2008 when the economy crashed. I was like, okay, so what is money exactly? <laughs> and I started looking into this. So by money over here, you don't mean just the bills, right? But you mean the other assets and all the other stuff. So uh, I, uh, I don't know, remember how much it is. The, the bills themselves are a very small percentage of all the money in circulation. Uh, to me, it's like 5%. I don't, it's probably less than that. So money, also goes like... money is the ledger. It's when exactly. It's in... And that ledger, yeah, it's, it's being and... held right now by the banks themselves and they kind of exchange it. Bitcoin is a, it's a public ledger. Um, I, I won't talk much about it. I don't think it's a, the best way to go about it. Uh, that, that, that if you guys are interested, draw on Gray. He has a very uh, interesting perspective. The biggest problem I have with the cryptocurrencies is that they're not uh, private. So if you analyze the ledger, you can figure out exactly who traded what, when. Uh, and it's very easy for governments or non-government entities to Control you. Uh, but yeah. if, the, if the reserve rate is zero, what, what's stopping me from like starting my own bank and printing it this one? Uh, yeah. So you still you still have. I think they have some. You need to have at least a, a hundred, couple of hundred million dollars oh. in to show that okay, I'm a legit <laughs> bank. But I mean, some Russian oligarch could give you that money and, and you could start it. But there's there's probably some other rules. It, it, it's not as easy. So this is where I'm like, 
there's more rules that are probably uh, because you've dropped your reserve rate to zero, there's probably something else that accounts for the fact that you won't have like rampant inflation. Okay, uh, this is gonna be the part of the presentation that's really gonna go big picture. And I'm, I'm not sure how many of you are interested in this, but I thought, okay, I'm gonna put it together. And I'm just gonna bite the bullet and go for it. Um, so yeah, take it as a big grain of salt. I, I don't know exactly what I'm talking about, but there's a lot of, a lot of interesting things here. So until now, um, I, the, the idea here is why I still think it's good to invest in the market. And also I'm like, okay, how can in the big, big picture, how can the market fail big time? And to me, it's like, if the market fails, it doesn't really matter what type of wealth you have, that wealth, it, it's gonna disappear. It's no longer gonna reflect any benefit to you or to me, I guess. Um, okay, so what drives the market? And this is, remember I talked about emotional cars, what was it? Uh, um, oh, uh, emotionally desirable cars. Yeah, okay, so, uh, uh, Mark Carney, who was the governor of Bank of Canada to, I guess, 2018 or something like that. He has a very good uh, set of lectures on uh, BBC. This is BBC Rife lectures, and you can listen to them. I don't know, when we go, when I go uh, running or something, I listen to these things. So he, he made the point that, okay, uh, originally probably like in the eight, when people started thinking about the economy. So economy, I don't know how many of you know, it means kind of managing your house it, from Greek or economicos or something, which is a little translation, managing your house. In the French in the 1800s, they come up with this word economy, managing our society. So in the 1800s, there was this novel kind of way of looking at the, our society in a scientific way. And you're trying to uh, peg kind of all the actions that we are taking. You're trying to see them through a more scientific perspective. There is idea of, okay, objectively, um, the econo economic value should reflect how much uh, there is this uh, labor and capital is being put in, uh, in, the, in the products that are being created. And there was an idea of, okay, the market itself through trading, it, there, it's gonna self align it. It's gonna reach an equilibrium. There's this idea of invisible hand that allows you to accurately price the product you have in your market. And that's gonna be reflected on some underlying kind of real physical constraints of your environment. Uh, that actually has changed, I think in the around 1920s or 1930s after the, the great depression. And there's this kind of change from an objective perspective to objective, subjective perspective where you're trying to establish how much value does a customer put on the products. And depending on, uh, I mean, I could build a piano and the amount of money that this, this piano required or the amount of assets and labor that this piano required was a certain value. But maybe, you know, I'm going to sell it to a pianist virtuoso and for him or her, this piano costs 10 times more. So I'm going to assign the value of the piano to however much you want to pay for it, however much you think this piano is and valued. Ideally, you would sell it for whatever exactly, exactly it's about, they value it as. And, and society in general changes how it values something to value in your market changes. Yeah, and we'll, yeah, so the, the okay. market, <laughs> Carney said, okay, the value is now in the eye of the beholder, not in the sweat of the labor. This was, I, I really like that quote of his. So as soon as you switch this idea of uh, the values, however much you want to pay for an asset, uh, you kind of switch to this consumer society where it's like, okay, now I'm going to try to convince you that this is valuable. And there's a lot of marketing around this and a lot of kind of psychological manipulation um, of how you consider something to be valuable. And I didn't put it here, but there's a, I told you guys yesterday about the century of the self. So that, uh, that, that's uh, documented, kind of captures some of this. And, it's very interesting how you can manipulate people's values. Um, and one of the first exercises, and I'm gonna, sorry, you guys you've already heard, heard this, it's for more for the Zoom crowd. Um, the first exercise that I, th I thought was very interesting was uh, how the suffragette movement in the 1920s um, was kind of co-opted into uh, uh, switching the perspective, what valuable it, what value is. And the, the, I can't remember his name. Uh, there was a, I think it's, it's some relative of Sigmund Freud he came to the United States, he, was, he partnered up with Camel, the cigarette makers. They were saying, okay, I'm gonna increase your sales and I'm gonna do that through advertisement and changing the perception of value with regard to the cigarettes. And what he said was, this guy put together an ad campaign where they were saying, okay, if you are a woman and you want to show how independent you are, uh, you have to smell, smoke cigarettes, Camel cigarettes specifically, because this shows how uh, you are kind of disobeying whatever may you do with order is being established upon you. 
And there are a lot of women who are like, okay, yes, I'm gonna smoke cigarettes as a symbol of my independence. And this is, I mean, that's kind of, that was the first exercise and they, they show that yes, it works. And it was very kind of interesting in how you can co-opt people's perspective of what valuable is. And then the car market kind of really ran with it where it was like, okay, the car nowadays is instead of using this type of color paint, it's a new type of color paint. Instead of having, uh, I don't know, headlights that look like this, the new trend is headlights that look like that. So you would want to buy these new cars, not because they are intrinsically more valuable, it's because you think they are more valuable. Um, this allows kind of this, like, this, this process of consumer society where you can come up with new versions and some the, the versions themselves might have some new, uh, let's say new functionality added. And I'm looking at, for example, nowadays cell phones. When cell phones were first created, they didn't really have a lot of, it was just like you could talk to someone. And you get a camera account kind of built in, then you get compass and GPS. Now, I don't know, you get LiDAR, but the, the, they're starting to plateau in kind of new functionality. And if you look at, uh, I recently read, um, I, in 2018, I think the lifetime of a cell phone is about two years. After two years, you would kind of buy a new one. Nowadays, it's about three years. So in about three years, all of a sudden, like you're using your cell phone more just because the amount of value that you can derive from your cell phone is kind of staying constant. I think a lot of people are realizing that you, the, the, even though we get an ad with all oh, the brand new Samsung, whatever it is, S30, uh, it's like, well, how, how it, the ad is just trying to elicit more value from you, but that's kind of, you're already value saturated. You're like, okay, <laughs> I'm not gonna pay more. Um, and this is, this, is, this is my equation of how, how I look at value. And it's the amount of desire you have per person. And this, you, can, you can conjure up more desire in someone by just through psychological manipulation times the number of people. And this is the value of the market overall. And then, I don't know, I just say minus availability. So if you make something that's unavailable, you can increase its value because you're like, oh, I want it, but it's not. Plus, um, when you subtract availability. Oh, sorry. You're saying like the more available it is, the less. The less, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's what I'm, I guess that's what I'm, yeah. That's what I'm trying to get at. The more available it is, the more, the less value it has. Um, so these, these, each one of these terms can be modified in a certain way. The, the one that has been modified a lot is this, uh, what, what we think desire is. Uh, overall, the population has been growing constantly. I don't know what the rate was, probably 3% over the last 100 years. So this amount has been going up. This increasing population is gonna plateau. So the value in the world is the underlying value because we have less fewer people is gonna probably start plateauing that way. And then there's also this availability. So things might start becoming unavailable and that's gonna like the chip shortage all of a sudden things are unavailable and now you have to pay all your diamonds. Yeah, you have to pay $400 for a Raspberry Pi because who the heck has a Raspberry Pi now? Um, so yeah, this is kind of how I was thinking about the consumer society. And consumer society, in a way it was good uh, because it allowed the iteration cycles to happen quite often and it allowed technology to grow fairly rapidly. At the same time, uh, it, it consumed a lot of resources. So it's a, that's an interesting point. Uh, thinking about kind of the consumer society, in the, this is 1980s. Um, uh, some economists are looking at it and kind of looking at our economy and saying, okay, it seems like we are using energy to create certain assets that we have that we use. But if you look at the, the assets that we use in creating the, these products, those are limited. At some point, I mean, this has been around for this concept of we are going to run out of resources for a while. But this, this was trying to make it a bit more um, capture it in a more detail and trying to show that, look, we are going to soon run out of resources. Um, what I'm looking at this is uh, the way I think about it is kind of um, taking, so I, and I don't know exactly how to capture it. So Schrodinger in the 1940s, I think he published a book on life and he coined the term negentropy. And what he meant by that was, um, and this is a lot of the polymaths, the physicists in the 1920s that kind of had the, all the insight about the quantum uh, kind of nature of our reality. They all all very interested in how economy works, how the brain works, how there, there, a lot, there was a lot of talks of, for example, Poincaré, they, he was com commenting on how economic analysis is being done. Uh, a lot of the economists, they were, I guess, very, um, they really wanted to become like physicists. They were, they were taking all these concepts from physics. They were trying to map them on the, how the economical machine works. And uh, they were trying to simplify things. Anyway, in the end, the kind of the, the concept of negentropy appeared as a idea of, okay, the life on earth is taking energy from the sun 
and instead it's instead of kind of converting it straight to low lower level energy like entropic just heat death of the universe it's capturing it into a, a lower entropy level so it's a higher complexity level structure so a cell is slightly more complex than just like a mass of an ocean just like water molecules then if you put cells together you get organisms and those are lower entropy than a single cell then you get ecosystems or societies of like structures that are uh, lower and lower entropy and that that term of lower entropy it was kind of coined as neg entropy which is it's not so Schrodinger at some point had to kind of go back to the physics committee and say like look this is not exactly neg entropy that you think in physics I just kind of he, he had a, some 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 part where he kind of wanted to comment on that so what we do is we take what I'm imagining is a reservoir of neg entropy which was created by the biosphere over four billion years of capturing energy from the sun and we are converting that neg entropy into some other form of neg entropy with some efficiency and that other form of neg entropy is like the keyboard I have in front of me, the computer that I have, but I'm I, I'm 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 de depleting the reservoir of neg entropy in in the biosphere. Because if you, if you look, you could go as a human go to Mars, you wouldn't have a lot of neg entropy on Mars. It's kind of it, there's still some, but it's much harder to kind of capture that and trans transform it into some some uh, some useful product unless you already knew about how to make things from Earth. So if you did it like biomimicry is a really good the way I think about it. We get inspired from solutions that were put together over billions of years of evolution. And we take that, that's kind of neg entropy for me. And we take that neg entropy and now we build our own concepts of it. If you, if you were kind of, if you're just imagining yourself being born in the middle of cosmos, like you can barely see the stars in the distance. And now you have to, from that particular informational scar, uh, sparse environment, try to come up with, okay, I will, I know that uh, if you have, if you align all these atoms in this particular way, you can create a, a, a forest. That's like insane amount of neg entropy you have to kind of mine to get to the idea from, from these basic laws of physics. Even if you knew the laws of physics, I'm gonna be able to build a forest. But uh, over 4 billion years, kind of through evolution, evolution has kind of explored the space of possible patterns that can be built and kind of came up with these different patterns. And those different patterns now are a reservoir of neg entropy that we can kind of extract neg entropy from to create our own processes. I, I think I've said neg entropy so, many, many so times. Neg entropy is a, is a kind of over time naturally made high order system. Exactly. That, you can, that effectively forms an asset that you can- That you can extract other, whatever. yeah, other energy from. And you know, you can make even higher entropy, higher order systems like computers, which yeah. are, you know, debatably more or less complicated. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to try to go through this right. a bit more in detail, maybe because okay. I'm realizing this idea. So there's uh, the entropy law, and the economic process, an interesting book from the 1970s that's capturing that. There are a lot of kind of high end or economists were thinking about this, and that has kind of died down to these these philosophical perspectives. But I think there we because technology is augmenting our abilities, we'll soon start bouncing into these limits, which is an interesting one. <laughs> and you has five raspberry pies. Um, so this, I'm talking about desirable items because you remember this equation with desirable, desire uh, availability, desirables. I thought this was an interesting plot showing going how fast things are being adopted. And through technology and kind of mass production, if some new technology is being is invented, the, the rate at which it saturates the market has decreased. It's increased and every, the time it needs for the, that particular technology to saturate the market has decreased. So cell phones, I think, take like, I don't know, 20 years to have like 90% of the people now have their own cell phone. It's very interesting because, um, yeah, in, in some, some development, developing countries, they actually skipped certain parts of the economic, economic growth. Uh, and they, through technology, they kind of jumped to, okay, I'm going to use cell phones for payments and I don't need an actual bank. Or so like everything is done. Phone. Yeah. When I lived in Southeast Asia, no one had a landline because why bother? Yeah, exactly. So it, it's a very interesting kind of this, this, availability is through consumer society and the economy it allowed allowed us to have much more easy availability of products. Uh, this is an, another, so I don't know if you guys are interested in reading, but Origin of Wealth, Evolution, Complexity, and the Radical Remaking of Economics. Um, a, another real interesting book. Most of the growth of the, in, in the value of our world or for society has happened over the last 100 years. And in a, in a time scale of uh, since humans have been around, 
it's it's more or less kind of a vertical cliff. And this this quote I really liked. It was uh, some. So if you think about your great grandparents, they were closer to somebody that was living in the Roman times in kind of their ability to uh, access wealth or value than they were to us. Um, so the the value that we have in our current society is is or yeah, it's, it's incommensurable to what humans used to have up to 1800s for probably hundreds of thousands of years. Um, and this is, is, we are still up climbing. So you know, we'll see when these, these exponential curves kind of have a tendency to level off at some point. Um, Veritasium has an interesting point about uh, how you can maintain this consumer society and planned obsolescence is kind of a key ingredient. You need to people to kind of uh, keep buying uh, the, in the 1950s, um, I think it was McDonnell Douglas, it was an airplane manufacturer in the United States. They actually ran out of business because their planes wouldn't break down. And then Boeing in the 1970s, they actually incorporated planned obsolescence in their parts. They're like, okay, this part is going to only work for this number of kilometers, after which you have to buy more. During the Great Depression, I think they started putting expiry dates on houses. Like they would just tear your house down because they're like, we need to generate some, <laughs> some, growth. some, yeah. some growth here. So cool. if you own your house for too long, we're tearing it down, you have to buy a new one. So this, this works if we want to maintain the consumer society work. And it, it, there is benefits to having a consumer society, but there's, as we, as we grow, those benefits are going to become smaller and smaller and smaller. Because you run out of resources. But exactly. And the century of the self is a, is a document and Dante hopefully watched right it. There. I'm sorry. That's some super villain quote right there. Uh, that, yeah. So this is, this is, this was, well, you have to put it in, in the perspective of the time. So this was when the great depression was just about starting. Um, and the idea was, look, people, and this was, yeah, you'd have like somebody in the countryside would be like, why the heck do I need to buy new shoes? My boots are still like, just as good. And people are like, well, you need to buy them because look how much prettier these are and one other. But I guess the farmer would be like, I don't really care. And then this guy was like, well, we need to teach them to value this more. And so we can sell these new products that we are making. Otherwise, our, our economy is going to kind of not grow as fast. It's, it's an interesting perspective. So, um, okay, so I talked about what I think drives the market growth. And this is this idea of value and kind of we have to implant it and allow people to Grow, grow, grow the what they think is desirable in their mind. And that's the exponential. Growth. That's the exponential growth. But the, the exponential growth is it's probably a few, a few things there. So population was growing exponentially. Technology was creating new as new type of product. So and this is this is our more people to exist. Yeah, this is what I'm trying to talk about here. Activities. So I don't know, a thousand years ago, or maybe I don't know, ten thousand years ago, you could just walk around. Then you invent boats, and now you can sail. So now maybe I want to sail. Now I, I, I'm riding horses, now I want to horses. So my economy is kind of, okay, I can ride a horse, now I have to buy a horse for somewhere, grow a horse or something. Okay. Now the idea of I invented a carriage, now I want the carriage. So I, I want, I create new assets I desire. And these, these through my desire, the economy actually, the, the market value, underlying market value is increasing because I have products that I desire that I need to make. You want a car, you want an airplane. Now, if you think about, okay, each one of these adding more things to desire, into your life as a as an individual. So now it's kind of I have a reservoir of desires in me. But if I have like if you imagine, okay, there's no cars invented. Everybody has carriages. Uh, it's it's kind of hard to desire another carriage. But if I give you a car, oh, the amount of desire I can extract from you has dramatically increased now because you want a car. Uh, so it's with technology, you kind of maintain the 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 pressure of desires, the the the, the potential of desires kind of going. And then that. Other end of that logistics curves comes from this next section. Probably, so yeah. So this is this is what what I think limits the growth. Um, and I have two ideas, and I think I think I've heard the one on energy quite uh, pop, it's fairly popular. The other one is cognition, and this is where I started putting on uh, on Discord the idea of we are limited in our we have a cognitive manifold that we are limited to. Um, before, so, okay, I'm going to talk just a tiny bit kind of how I, or I was looking at society and how society was built upon different structures, like social structures and what gave value to our society. And I would say probably until probably 1980s, maybe 1970s, there were different pillars that supported our society. Uh, I mean, kings and queens, this is probably very archaic, but what I meant to say was there's kind of a ruling class that you would say, okay, yes, the value of my economy has collapsed, but at least my king is going to lead us to a new path on a new path. And I'm going to align myself with all that. And I, 
believe in our king and whatever your nation was. Uh, everything as, as the market kind of took over, this is how I kind of perceive our society looking right now. So nobody really cares about religion. I mean, there, there's, there's some pockets, but you don't derive a lot of value from being part of a religion or you don't derive a lot of value from your you can't monarch. Sell. Yeah, or, yeah, exactly. Or the, the local society, now we live in these huge communities. And so this, while well, I was living around 400 other people and you know, if I ran out of sugar or something, I would go talk to my neighbor or something and we would exchange things and it would have value. It would be very like intimate value in my community. That has kind of disappeared, and uh, th that kind of took away some. Some uh, now everybody's living on the pillar of market, so everything is kind of predicated by how well the market is doing. And I don't know if that's a good thing or bad. <laughs> so it's just the idea of being that the mark, our our value no longer comes from those things because we're no longer so reliant on those things. In a way, through okay. technology, and th this is the again, it was Mark Carney who made the point that uh, through market, uh, the value of uh, everything in this was relationship with your family relationship with your peers kind of relationship with what you would consider kind of philosophy and whatnot is is being so the, the, those values that we are holding kind of dear and they were kind of independent of price through the market now we assign a price to everything and everything is kind of tied into this this idea of market value is becoming intrinsic value so what we used to consider to be values now we just look at it that okay we can assign monetary value on it uh, the tricky bit to me is that if something is not captured by the market value, in, in our perspective, that's through the lens of the market, a lot of time it has no value. So if the market doesn't incorporate it, it doesn't price it. It means that in, in our perspective, it, it, okay, we don't know what value it has, it must be value, it valueless or something. So the default is zero. Default is zero. And this was kind of the idea of the Amazon forest versus the Amazon, the company. Um, and the example, the, 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 this another, this is, all these ideas are not mine. I'm just kind of extracting them from different books I've been reading. So there's a, there's a tribe in the, the Amazonian or Noko River uh, called the Anomamo. Um, and they, okay, they live on a river, we live on a river. They, most of the time they spend hunting and whatnot. We spend it in other ways. <laughs> uh, they live in very small communities, so their value system is aligned with their small community. We live in very large communities. They make about, a, I, if you were to translate the assets that they generate, they use in their daily life and how much money they make, they make about $100 a year. We make or something around $50,000 a year. The interesting thing is it's not this difference of 500 between what we make and what they make. With the money we make, we have access to about 10 billion different products that in a way remember that desire so each product as you can use it to kind of hey you want this product i need a bit of your desire so i can extract some price it in somehow so we have uh, so this this number was extracted from do you guys know what skus are storage uh, storage keeping units so if you go to i don't know somewhere and they'll have a barcode or some sort so there's about 10 billion dollars 10 billion different types of products skus out there probably more and if you're a, a, one of these kind of simpler societies, you'll probably have access to a hundred different products. You can buy a better spear or a better shovel or something. So the, most of the value that I perceive in our society is not the fact that we're making $50,000 here instead of a hundred. It's the fact that we have access to like these 10 billion different products. And the odds that one of them will excite you in some way. In some way, yeah. Um, and we'll, we'll see. So this is this kind of, a perspective, I'll, I'll come back to it. So this is, I'll, I'll use it again. Back to this plot. So I try to capture this. So remember this, this blue line is the, what we consider to be the market value. That's all the products that are priced in by the market. In red is the, the money that's assigned to that market's intrinsic value. Then I, I try to capture kind of social, the society system that we use, the value in that. And as technology is kind of improving itself, the, our social system, in a way, is not going to keep up with advancements in society, in the technology, in the technological value. Our society value, and I don't, it's a very kind of fuzzy concept, is going to grow much slower. So I guess our ethical systems, our how we perceive kind of how, how we can do good with, is not going to advance at the same rate as technology advances. We'll, we'll kind of plateau. Well, it's not going to plateau. This is, if you look at the uh, 
equations I'm using here. This is a square root. So it, it's going to still grow, but at a much slower rate. Uh, but then there's this part that I don't think we are in any way capturing the, the ecosystem value. And this is that big reservoir of neg entropy that lives in, in kind of our environment itself, so our biosphere. And yes, and we are slowly degrading it, not slowly. At the <laughs> rapid pace, we are degrading it through the technology we use. So what used to, I don't know, I'm thinking like in the 1940s, United States, for example, they built their highway system. And it took them 10 years to build a highway system or maybe 20 years. And they paid, if you think about it, in 20 years, you can actually pay almost like an entire or half of someone's professional life they could spend just building that highway system. So they could live off building the highway system in 20 years. China did the same thing in six years. Uh, so through technology, they were able to extract from the neg entropy of our environment, many, many more resources. And instead of you being able to building an entire highway system to allow someone to live off for half their life, now they could only live off for six years of their life. Because that uh, the through technology we, we are much better at augmenting our abilities, and uh, through technology we can extract way more resources from our environment. So this is in a way kind of when I think about this is this is gonna be like what's gonna limit that exponential growth? In a way, I'm like okay, we are gonna if we don't have some new reservoir of neg entropy, we are gonna be depleting the one that we have right now. Um, so. I have this idea of, okay, until the 2000s, uh, the means of production were this, this equation, it was kind of the labor plus capital determines the means of production, so what you're producing. Uh, uh, there's this idea of, okay, we have to incorporate energy into the means of production. And uh, Stephen Keane is an Australian economist that has, has worked on this, and, but I mean, there's others. This is a physicist at uh, UC San Diego, I think, uh, who published, I think is the first textbooks, physics textbooks that talks about how we are living on a finite planet and the fact that we can use resources in, a, in an exponentially grow, growing rate is gonna stop our growth. And he tries to go through different kind of scenarios and what we can do about it. I don't know if the, the answers he gives are very useful yet, but it's a good perspective to have if you guys are interested in it. Um, and this is me kind of looking at, you guys can go to the map. At, uh, at how much energy we are using. So this is in terawatt hours. And this was, uh, I took it from a BP. Interestingly, uh, yeah, the, the oil energy is, they have all these very good reports at uh, capturing the different types of energy that we are producing and using. Um, in 2019, so this was, we we're using slightly above 160 terawatts. And I think they give it in exawatts instead of terawatt hours so, or exajoules, sorry, it's exajoules that they use. Um, and this is, this is kind of, if you look at that per person, uh, and I took uh, a human uses about 2.2 kilowatts hour um, per day. And if you divide this number per number of people in the world, uh, you would uh, on average, I think, um, where did I put that? I don't, I don't have it in this plot, but a, a US uh, citizen would be using the equivalent energy of 90 people. And somebody in India would be using the equivalent energy of eight people. Uh, this is kind of the energy usage per person um, at different times. In uh, through Stone Age, it was kind of up to pro like the 16 or 1200s. It was about the same. When we invented heating, it kind of started going up. Um, and then kind of right now we are using about 50 kilowatt hours, I think, on average per person per day. Um, China is coming really hot in, so they, they are they are growing really rapidly, um, and it's it's kind of interesting interesting perspectives here. So I was trying to get a feel for it. And looking at this energy uh, consumption, I didn't really get a, a good. I'm, I'm trying I'm trying to develop an intuition for what this means. So I came up with I looked at if what's the total energy uh, that can be dissipated by all the nuclear warheads that we have available on, on Earth right now. And this is actually a bit less than we, we used to have. I think we had the 60,000 uh, nuclear warheads, but uh, the communist USSR can disintegrate it, and hopefully we remove some of those. But uh, the current, in 2019, if you look at the energy we inject in the system or we use in the system, it's equivalent to detonating all the nuclear arsenal 28 times. Then I looked at another one was, uh, I don't know if you guys know about this Chicxulub meteorite that killed the dinosaurs. So in 2019, we are using about 14.14% of the energy of that impact. 
and that's growing. So um, this was 100 teratons. And I also looked at uh, all the energy coming from the sun that's hitting Earth. Uh, we are using about right now in 2019, about one ten thousandth of that energy. And if you look at the doubling rate of that energy, it's about 30 years. If that somehow keeps, go keeps growing uh, the same rate, in about 400 years, we would be using all the energy that's hitting Earth from the sun. So you, assuming you can. So this is, there's, there's definite limits. So this is what I'm talking about, what stops us from growing. So this is, this is kind of one of those limits. Uh, I think the energy usage, uh, we can probably go around it. I think there's new technologies, nuclear fusion, I don't know, maybe going out to space, building something that allows you to keep using energy at a fairly high rate. Uh, at some point, though, um, if you are, this is, this is, you might have heard of the Kardashev scale of civilizations. If you reach scale two, where you are using enough energy that's equivalent to the output of a star, if you think about using that energy on Earth, uh, it, it, you're just going to start boiling away the planet. So. Uh, if we want to use these, I don't think you can use them on Earth. You have to be somewhere else. Um, so this is this, is, yeah, somehow. somehow. So, and this is my idea of. Uh, I was talking to uh, some of you guys yesterday. If you had an alien civilization or extraterrestrial civilization coming on Earth, and they had the abilities to control uh, energy resources that are on the scale of a star, they probably wouldn't be able to interact with us in any meaningful way because any small mistake in their perspective of, oh, we have to dump some energy somewhere, they could just vaporize kind of our entire ecosystem. Um, so the, the, the idea is the, also kind of the idea of power. So how much energy use per unit of time, they can't use it in on our time scales because they, their amount of energies are vast. So they would have to use the energy on much longer time scales. So their ability to interact with us would be like, okay, over the 10,000 10, years, they might interact with humans really slowly. So they don't dump too much energy into our system. Uh, it's kind of fairly exotic uh, kind of train of thought. This is my, so after reading a few more books, I was like, okay, so the, the means of production, it was labor plus capital plus energy. Maybe the way I think about it is instead of thinking of um, capital, I'm thinking about, I'm gonna translate that capital. So this is assets that you own to that allow you to manufacture things more easily. I'm gonna translate that into complex systems. And this is a book that kind of was a landmark for me out of control, um, it was written by the guy who founded the magazine Wired. I don't know how many of you guys have heard of that magazine. Uh, so he talks about how um, as technology advances and we are kind of developing techniques that allow us to manipulate matter at nanoscale and our systems, control systems are becoming much more complicated. We are starting to look at nature and realize that actually nature has solved some of these problems that we are encountering in many different ways. We are getting inspired by that. And, the, the, uh, the, he has these concepts of the, made, the world of the made, so this is what we create, and the world of the born, so this is what has evolved over a billion of years, are starting to merge, where we are starting to use the same techniques that the world of the born has, is using to solve problems. And we are starting to be able to understand the world of the born, the world that has evolved around us, and use it to uh, extract the neg entropy in much more effective ways, much more efficient ways. Um, so this, this kind of goes back to my, this is where I'm gonna go really crazy. Um, in machine learning, there's this concept of uh, trying to find a manifold that reduces the, so in, in machine learning, you'll have um, a, a set of input that you will use to train your neural network or something like that. So you'll train your model. And this input is many dimensional. It has many, many, many different dimensions. And what the, the models that you're trying to develop is trying to do is, collapse that multidimensional input into a lower dimensional space on which you can create clusters that you can say, okay, this is of type of a class of type A and this is of type class of type B. And on this lower dimensional manifold, and the manifold itself here is, uh, is a, the, the, it's a, it's got a very exact definition, but to give you an intuition, it's a lower dimensional Kind of pattern in a high dimensional space. This is how I think of a manifold. We have closed manifolds, all kinds of different manifolds. Um, but uh, there's, if you guys want to get a better intuition, uh, Ben, who's third or fourth year now, he, he pointed uh, to this really good video. Um, there's some, some, somebody kind of tried to explain more intuitively. In, in a, in a the, the idea that I was, the way I was envisioning it, and this guy kind of does a much better job at explaining it with a video 
was if you have this multidimensional space that's an, an image, for example, if you were to look at a, a few different dimensions of that uh, image space, you could capture in those, and this could be these dim dimensions, you can imagine them being kind of each pixel is a dimension and the way you kind of traverse that dimension would be the intense, the, the, gray, the grayscale of that pixel. So you could have 255 values for each pixel. And then that would be the one pixel would be a dimension. And then if you have a, an image that's let's say, I don't know, 16 by 16. So I don't know, 4 billion pixels, you would have a 4 billion dimensional space and each dimension would have 255 values or something. But in that dimensional 4 billion dimensional space, uh, the, the representation of a human face is a much smaller, it's, it's on many smaller dimensions. You can, you can capture it by only looking at a, uh, a collapse uh, representation of the dimensional space. And that, if you look at those, those faces, so those fewer dimensions, if you're to traverse one of the dimensions, it allow you to say, okay, if I modify the values on this particular dimension, I'm going to make a human face kind of go from a, a straight face to a smiling face, or I can rotate the face. If you watch this video, the, what I'm trying to capture here is going to be a bit more intuitive. The idea here is that um, our, our, this is how I think about it, our brain collapses the diversity of uh, reality into a, a, its own, what I call a cognitive manifold. So our brain cannot understand reality in its full diversity. And in order to extract patterns that it can use, it collapses in a much more simplified version of it. This is what I'm trying to show here with this picture. You take a very like complex image, and in your mind, you have a representation of it that's much more simplified. But when we operate our system of values on this particular representation of reality, so we take a rich value system and we simplify it, and we say, okay, these are the values that we think exist in this system, and we 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 through our brain we we actually reduce the intrinsic value of the rich system because you cannot perceive it through our kind of cognitive abilities. Um, <laughs> again, if you want to watch some, this is more if you want. Yeah, there's, there's lots of references here. What is the, the underlying reality of what we perceive? And uh, the, there's an entire school of thoughts. And I think um, Daniel Hoffman or, uh, has a, a really good kind of explanation on this. He talks about, OK, we perceive reality as if you were to look at a desktop screen. But is that actually the, the nature of reality? The nature of reality, the code that create, generated this, uh, this desktop that you're perceiving, is that nature of reality kind of underlying hardware that might be something that's uh, creating this representation. Uh, we are kind of observing reality at a, at a certain level, and that doesn't allow us to understand kind of the, the different dimensions on which you can incorporate the value of reality into our systems. Uh, so, uh, you might have seen this in 35, or I'm not sure who has seen this in 35. I've added it uh, through our technology amplification system. We've kind of um, this this very simple perspective on reality was generated through evolution, and it, it, our understanding of what reality is for millions of years allowed us to live and uh, reproduce. And our understanding of reality is predicated on us being able to live and reproduce. And that those that understanding was kind of uh, it allows us to like when when you think about desires, those desires are a lot of times kind of embedded in what how we the emotions we generate. And those emotions were through I don't know billions of years of evolution were created so that we can just keep our this pattern that we call a human being uh, existing in in our reality. But this this particular set of filters which we call kind of well i mean there's different levels so emotions are one way of one way to look at intelligence you have this, this frontal cortex that evolved later on it's a way to allow us to uh, achieve our whatever we our desires are our emotions more effectively is has is, is grown on top of that and now we have the cyber cortex through technology we have another layer that augments our ability to achieve our desires that are emotions uh, through all these uh, the underlying system that's kind of filtering what our understanding of reality is is still kind of at the slow level. We we haven't improved our understanding of I mean very slowly through physics maybe, but we don't have a good intuition of what the richness of reality is, and that's going to result in us kind of not uh, this is destroying a lot of it and kind of limiting our ability to grow. And this is um, again you can you can read some more. So the, the idea here was of talking about through these uh, 
and that our frontal cortex has developed these new tools. And these tools, in the, or the, back in the day, they were very primitive. Now they are becoming technology kind of a, uh, a layer on their own. So our cell phone, we no longer need to kind of, I don't longer need to remember something. I just kind of can Google it. Uh, so those tools allow us, allow me to amplify my desire. So if I not amplify, it's achieve my desires more easily. So if I want to travel to the other side of the world, if I desire that through technology, I can, yeah, I can do it. But the, the impact of that is, is, I don't understand that impact very careful, very well because I don't understand reality very well. Uh, so there's a disconnect between our abilities and kind of our, the feedback system is, is kind of broken right now. We can, we no longer understand exactly what the impact of our desires is. Before when our desires were fairly limited, we actually didn't have a lot of impact and maybe it wasn't very important to close that. Um, this, is, this is where I was talking, trying to kind of capture how we are mining the negative entropy of the uh, biosphere and we are converting in other types of negative entropy. And a lot of it is, I mean, yeah, a lot of it is kind of just very simple desires. And I, I don't know how to solve this, but you need the house. So a lot of us kind of desire that and it's a very basic desire. Um, I mean, you, you have cars and whatnot. A lot of times you also have these, if, if you're imagining kind of this is a negative entropy reservoir and the area here is somehow correlated to, the, and also the position here, the different type of patterns. Uh, so the, the biosphere itself is going to capture a certain domain of patterns that it, it, it explored. Through technology, we are probably exploring different patterns. So I know space travel, the biosphere would not be easily be able to explore that type of regime of patterns that you can develop in. Um, nuclear fission, I don't think there's any biological derived nuclear fusion or fission processes. Mm -hmm. So through technology, we can explore that particular type of patterns and maybe you know, unlock some, some new neg entropy in a way. This is kind of genetic engineering. And this is the, all these things I'm gonna to try to at the end kind of say, okay, how can we develop, maintain our biodiversity? So maybe biodiversity kind of falls through some recombinant technology. We can increase it again if we can. So we are mining the biodiversity, the neg entropy of uh, our environment and maybe generating some new neg entropy, but a lot of it is you'll have something like this where, okay, I'm gonna make more plastic cups or something, or which is, which is fairly simple patterns. It's not, it's not, we're not diving much further than the biodiversity, the, the neg entropy that was in, in, in our ecosystem. So plastic is just a slightly different type of polymer uh, that actually uh, ecosystems actually develop too. Uh, and this is, this is I, I mean, I kind of alluded to this, this whole reservoir of neg entropy over 4 billion years of energy has been slowly encapsulated in it. And I mean, it's not perfect as certain species died and whatnot, but uh, overall, this, this is kind of I think about it. And when I was looking at these, this, these are some very interesting, I don't know, to me, they're very interesting videos. This is a, a I'll, keep, I'll get the playing here, but I'll talk about this part. Uh, this is a human uh, embryo kind of developing into a place. When I look at it, but I think that my stuff, uh, it's kind of back of the billion years ago that the first ever look at this kind of place, look at the cellular and whatnot, and maybe the first step is out. A lot of times it's going to look like space, like skills and whatnot, and the pattern of the species from 4 billion to whatever, 3 billion to 3 billion to 9 months, from the fed up version of the species. Um, this is the case of my very cool and um, the sort of cells the more very complex organism. So it's really uh, allowing us some like as far as I can get it. ideas and I'm, hopefully I'm not going to lose you. Uh, the, and, and, and trying to put a lot of uh, metaphors in here and maybe that's, that's going to convey some of the intuition. This is, uh, if, if you were to give, uh, I, I think of us and our access to our, the, the current biosphere um, is trying to give someone from um, a thousand years ago a cell phone. And they'd be like, hey, here's the cell phone. 
and they wouldn't know what to do with it. They will look at it and be like, okay, it looks like a little brick. Maybe I build a wall out of it. And this is what I was trying to convey here. So I'm gonna use these cell phones to build a wall. It's the same way I think we use the neg entropy that was captured by the biosphere in 4 billion years. We use it in a very, very simplistic way. We use it to build cars or, uh, and we, we solve certain problems that we have in the moment, but we could use the same pattern. And this is where I was thinking like, if you go to space or somewhere to a new planet and you, or I don't know, you go to Titan and you wanna convert something from methane to something else, that particular process, you might find it being solved by some underwater ecosystem that actually had the same problem. And over 4 billion of years, it had actually explored the different solutions and it allowed it to find a solution. Um, it might be that we don't need the biosphere. We can probably, some technology, maybe we can advance our understanding of all these different patterns. When I talk about this, unless you've read some, like I let that book out of control and there's also a library of Babel, maybe some of you have heard of it. You know, Satish recommended to some people. Um, you, it, it, this is gonna sound very exotic, very kind of out there. Uh, and it's, it's difficult to bring everyone to the same kind of level. Um, Sorry about that. So the, the intuition here is if you give someone a cell from, from nowadays, a thousand years ago, they wouldn't know how to use it effectively. And it's the same with us. Maybe if we were to teleport us a thousand years from in the future, someone back to, the, to now, they'll be like, oh, you, you should use your ecosystem in these ways, which is way more effective than what you're using it right now. With, in my mind, you would probably want to maintain that information diversity still kind of as a, as a reservoir for us to be able to use it later on. And going back to these guys uh, with the, the 10 billion products, maybe there's quadrillion different products in our ecosystems that we don't really understand how, to, how they work. And because we don't understand how they work, we are like the Yanomamo tribe where we think like, oh wait, there's only a hundred ways we can use our, our environment. Um, I don't know if this whole you know, <laughs> talk made any sense, but hopefully that there was some intuition that developed in your mind there. Uh, with more, again, I mean, this was nine, 2018 or something like that. That is the new oil. So maybe through our new systems of understanding kind of how to manipulate data, we are starting to kind of, oh, wait a second, we can mine some of those patterns in effective ways um, that are going to allow us to continue the growth and maybe allow us to also maintain, say, okay, look, we can save our ecosystems and use them as an inspiration. Because the, the cool thing about the ecosystems is they maintain themselves. So it's if you give them, if you operate on the right time scales, they will just reproduce. And if you just pump energy in them, you can maintain that pattern that was developed over 4 billion years. They, it's just almost like a crystal. It stays in a homeostatic in kind of uh, status. Um, can I just summarize? Go for bit? it, go for it. I think if you, yeah. What, so we're saying that in, in modern day, our kind of mo monetary value has become kind of aligned with just what is desirable um and that kind of has been exponentially growing as we've been able to create new 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 things now that growth of technology allowing us to have more things that we might want and therefore to increase the value of the world we live in is possibly plateauing because a we're running out of resources to mine and b we're our brains all can only think of so many ways to use those resources to make new things uh, and then we moved on to that from there to say, well, you know, there, we can only do so much about the resources that are here, but we can expand the way that we think and uh, kind of overcome some of that cognitive manifold and think in higher dimensions if we're thinking and, from the manifolds. Yeah, so the, if you look at our ecosystem, our ecosystem, if you can look at the patterns that, and this is us kind of developing a microscope, and now you can look at cells and be like, oh, this is how they work. Our imagination is not good enough at imagining how reality actually looks. Our imagination is limited. And that's but limiting the value we can, we can generate. generate. Okay. Yeah. And by, by maintaining the diversity of the ecosystem and being able to now peer into the ecosystem, it's almost like you're expanding your imagination. Mm -hmm. It's uh, our, really our imagination is, think about the 1920s, uh, how we are imagining the world to be. And now you're like, oh wait, there's uh, quantum, yeah, yeah, there's anti-gravity, yeah. Kilobytes of RAM. Or in, in that, so <laughs> it's, it's a very, I think it's a very precious resource that we, and because the market hasn't incorporated in its value system, it's not being priced in. So we don't use it effectively. Both our resources and our ability to expand our cost exactly. abilities. Okay. Yeah. Um, and this is, this is, again, it's kind of on the same theme. So we, 
I'm thinking like we take oil and we generate plastic out of it, which is plastic is a small, a similar pattern to this, a low level pattern in terms of complexity um, that we are kind of spending into our environment. And this is an interesting point that somebody made that by 2050, the amount of plastic in the ocean is gonna be equivalent in mass to the, all, the amount, all the weight of the living things in the ocean. So through our technology now, we have the ability to just uh, we'll transform most of the wildlife in the ocean to plastic. So we've reduced the, this very complex system to a very simple pattern. Uh, I mean, yes, we use plastic in a certain way, but I'm thinking like, is that in, in a thousand years from now or a hundred years from now, or do I not go back and be like, hey man, you just destroyed all these cell phones to build this little hut instead of <laughs> using these cell phones to actually expand your society to a much higher level. Um, and, and that's what you're talking about, about like the efficiency with which you mine your resources. Exactly. It's, it's, and one example here, this is again, things are evolving very fast. So I don't, I don't know where we get. Uh, so this example is uh, it's sponsored by, remember when I talked about Jim Simmons, the guy who was making 70% per year in, uh, in kind of uh, in, through his fund. So that mathematician guy, he's now sponsoring a lot of interesting science projects. He has the Jim Simmons Foundation. And one of them is uh, somebody's trying to use machine learning to uh, translate uh, how whales talk to human speech. And I don't know how much you guys know about uh, autoencoders and whatnot. There's, there's a certain way you can create this uh, abstraction um, level layer that is going to encapsulate the kind of the patterns in a certain particular data set. And you can translate those uh, different types of patterns in a different type of data set. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm tentatively optimistic that we are slow, rapidly developing our understanding of our environment. And we are starting to extract the value from it. We are starting to perceive the value in it and maybe we can price it in in some way, right? Or maybe we can't. The tricky bit is, yeah, we, everybody's kind of focused on these little problems we have and there's, there's much bigger problems. Um, and uh, there's, there's uh, to me, the climate change is a big problem, but uh, it's not as big of a problem as biodiversity collapse because uh, the way I think about it, climate change, I can go on Mars and terraform Mars in let's say a thousand years but I wouldn't be able to recreate the biodiversity on Mars in a thousand years that we have on Earth. I need actually that more or less 4 billion years of constant energy and kind of evolutionary processes to occur to give me this diversity. Um, there's, there's a really good book um, and I don't, I, I put it in the references. I don't know how many of you guys know about the Ministry of the Future. It's written by this guy, Kim Stanley Robinson. Um, he's, he's a science fiction writer and he tries to portray how we are kind of rapidly reducing our biodiversity through our pursuit of simple desires, more or less. Um, okay. And in that regard, like we took what started as like monetary value is the, the labor and gold it takes to make whatever you're making to simplifying that down to desires and what we need to do is expand it to include other things in those values lest we yeah. destroy it all. Okay. Yeah, and I, I, in my mind, I think our, I have no idea how things are progressing, but our understanding of what's valuable is going to change dramatically as we go deeper into understanding of reality. So, so this kind of expansion of human cognition is not just going to increase value, but also change how that value is defined. Yeah, okay. and I'll, I'll have a slide at the end, hopefully. Try to maybe after the slide, the slide deck is over, we can spend some time then discussing some. <laughs> this of these is like things. the most exotic, like rebuttal of efficient market hypothesis. <laughs> uh, the market, so the market of being efficient has been debunked by. So physicists in the 1920s are like, oh, this is insane. How you guys think about? Uh, the, it, yeah, I'm not. I, I'm not going to go into that because that's, uh, that's a whole universe. But it has been embodied in many different in many different ways. So remember when I when, what I was trying to get with these talks is kind of. Um, explore with you guys what your understanding of value is and what your understanding of money is. And I know a lot of, or there's some people who have very unhealthy obsessions with what value, what making money. There's other people who are just ignoring what money is. But I think it's important we have a good balance of what that, what the trade-offs are and whatnot. So I, I, this is a slide that I started with the, the first part of the presentation and the beginning. Um, I'm going to go kind of in my personal, how I think, see things and hopefully my perspective is going to give you guys and your perspective is going to create a, you have two different perspectives and you can create some sort of reference points now. Um, it, I mean, I think you all know that after a certain amount of income, your, the amount of uh, value you derive from that income or happiness plateaus. 
So uh, keep that kind of in the back of your mind as you, as you go through this. Money, a lot of times I think it's a very simple, uni a single number that you can use to compare yourself with everybody else. You'd be like, oh, if I make more money than somebody, I must be doing better. Uh, remember money is not capturing all the things we value. And a lot of times if you look at people who are very rich and you ask them, okay, are you happy? They will not be, as, I mean, you, 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 you look at your friends and see, okay, how many are happy and rich and versus kind of less rich, but they have better like social connections and kind of much more, uh, there's many different dimensions that, in which you can be happy. And money I think is not the one you should be looking at to define what, what determines your values. Uh, this is a personal opinion. There's everybody else, you'll, you'll have people who'd like, oh, it's better to cry in a Ferrari than kind of cry on the side road. Which is interesting. It's why are you trying to begin with? Um, yeah, uh, I I pulled out this this uh, chart of how to think about somebody's life from uh, was the autobiography of uh, Keith Graham. And Keith Graham was uh, Catherine Graham was uh, the owner of um, I think it was the Washington Post, um, and she was one of the first business women when uh, kind of after the emancipation of women. Kind of she was. One of the first one who had a business that was a big business. Uh, and this was, this was not her, this was her father who was, uh, uh, can't remember his name, he was the uh, first president of the World Bank. And he was saying that the way he perceives his life to uh, be sectioned and is you, know, you have these different stages and you want to sequence your stages so that you can transition from one stage to another with the minimum impedance mismatching. So you'll, you'll kind of stage it so you can go from one to another easily. These were the stages he, uh, he kind of recommend he was talking about. So you grow up schooling and then you kind of develop yourself and uh, professionally and you start a family and then kind of once you've started a family you, you, and you have established yourself, you just grow for a while and then hopefully you can, after you've grown, I don't know if these ages ranges are efficient or not, you, you want to give back to your community in a way. Uh, this was, I was talking to some other people and they were, they were they, I was talking about what are some landmarks that you would say were important in your life. And I, I mean, I, it's fairly pragmatic, but these are big, big landmarks that I think are standing out in my mind too. So finding a partner is important, kind of your firstborn. I think another big one is kind of death of your parents where you will be like, well, now I am the leader. I took the reins of whatever this family is, or, or maybe this group is, or, uh, and I don't know how many of you are thinking about these, but I think it's important to have them at some point, bring them uh, like over your horizon. So in, in your future, you'll have to think about these things because um, with, with a consumer society, everything is now, 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 you have to buy this, do that. This is what's gonna be valuable. This is what makes you happy. And uh, remember that market is the single pillar. <laughs> things are not exactly that. So the, you think only from the market perspective, you're gonna miss a lot of other things. Um, in the, in your life, and this is this is kind of me, kind of if I'm my personal and, and in that things. sense, that that shift from you know society being supported from multiple pillars to one where it's just a market is a is a criticism you're making. In a in a way, I mean, it has its values. So that's sure. the thing. But those values, I think, are you, I think as an engineer, the biggest thing that I learned is when I develop a model, what are the boundaries in which this model operates effectively. And I should not use that model outside those boundaries because madness is going to ensue. And I don't think, yeah, I don't think we, because we are fairly focused on, oh, we are using the market, we can think that we can use the market everywhere. The market is a solution for everything, but we have to learn how to weave the market efficiency with other systems of values. Because the market is actually, it, it helped develop us into, into this society. It's, it's like a, it's a sword, so you can use it and it's useful when you use it properly, but you shouldn't just use it for everything. Um, at, at the end, I, I really like how, uh, as, and unfortunately I can't remember his name, he put it and um, he was talking about education and how education is important. And I'm, uh, I've combined this with, uh, there's a, a series of talks by Richard Hamming, and this is, I don't know how many of you took uh, signals and systems or something, or you talk about Hamming windows and whatnot, this is an engineer a fairly well-versed engineer who worked with Shannon on CRO communication or not. He has a, a, a lecture series, I think when he retired in the 1990s, where he talks about the doubling rate of knowledge in our society, in our, in our system. He talks, I think he, he said it was about 70 years, the doubling rate. So if you think about what you've learned right now and you graduate from university, 
uh, in a professional life that's maybe 30 years, you will need to learn two times as much to be able to operate when you, when you retire in terms of knowledge. Uh, if you are, if I'm thinking like if my children were born, they would have to learn more. So I'm, I'm here when I have to learn, I would have to learn up to here. This is my, how in 20 years, so I'm born. By the time I graduate, I have to learn about this much. So this is my learning rate. As you are getting born later, your learning rate has to increase dramatically to be able to understand the, the, the systems and kind of how they operate and do we uh, understand them so that you can operate them effectively. Um, so I think a big component of the, the, the social system we have is going to be education. So trying to transfer the knowledge we have to the next generation so they can maintain the social system kind of, or not only the social system, biosphere, everything working effectively. And I don't know how that's going to work. It's, it's kind of to me, it's like, ah, I see the problem, but I, I don't know exactly what the solution is. Um, so in the sense that we need to improve education systems because the learning curve is getting steeper. Steeper, 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 yeah. And so not only make it free, but this, the actual, the actual education process. process needs to be somehow modified. Um, this is how Can I think about things. Can I just have physics courses at us? Maybe we've been talking about this. Yeah. <laughs> um, the other thing I was, was going to mention, this is this is a really cool game. If you guys want to play, there's the, there's this whole game theory. I don't know if you at the Vancouver School District moved on or pro. Yeah, so I saw that, which is unfortunate. Um, so the, Andrew says that the Vancouver School District removed honors programs from their curriculum, which is unfortunate. But I mean, we'll see how things go. So uh, in the in, uh, there's this whole um, uh, it was I think. Um, von Neumann in the 1930s who developed, uh, I think the first uh, theory on game theory. Um, and uh, nowadays uh, a really good example is the prisoner's dilemma where you, I hope most of you kind of know about it some more or less kind of do you cooperate or you do not cooperate with, with others. And the idea here was, okay, is there a, a perfect, is there an optimal uh, way in which you can uh, behave and that's gonna be the best way you can behave. And uh, this, this is a game that you can play. I really like it. I actually translated it to Romanian, so I made it available for others. Uh, Nick Case is a, a really cool uh, creator, so he puts these out for free. The, uh, the original Prisoner's Dilemma was just two people, right? Exactly. So this is like an expanded. Oh, yeah. So this is the, when, when, if you go to this website, it's going to start as two people. Okay. And you play in these two people, and this is just a population. The game is still being played between two people, oh, okay. but the population has different, uh, different types of actors. Excellent. And uh, in the 1980s, I think there was a, uh, I'm not sure if you, what, what education or what branch of science he was in, but he had a, a global competition where it's like, okay, you write an algorithm that's gonna play against anybody else's algorithm. And whoever wins gets the prize, the best algorithm. And originally it was that the algorithm that came ahead was a uh, tit for tat. So if you, whatever you do to me, I'll do to you. And then it turned out, well, okay, in a certain populations, tit for tat is the best algorithm. But if the, as the population changes, tit for tat is no longer the optimal algorithm. It's tit for tat with forgiveness. The population changes again. So this is kind of the, the number of actors that play a certain algorithms, that distribution, that the number of actors changes. And that's what I'm talking about, the population. And then the strategy, the optimal strategy changes. Um, and this is, this is kind of the, the, some of the results he published. Oh, I guess it's 97, so it's a bit newer. Um, here you can see the percentage of the, so in here population, the, whoever's playing strategy one is at about 80% of the population. Uh, whoever's playing strategy 10 is at about, I don't know, whatever this is, 20% of the population. As games progress, certain strategies kind of take over and then they disappear. And others take over and disappear. Um, and so there's, it was proven and somebody else proved that if you play repeated prisoners dilemmas games with unknown number of rounds, there is no optimal. It's a, it's a chaotic system and you're constantly gonna bounce around. And this is in machine learning is called, there's a, also a concept called the no free lunch hypothesis, which says that whatever model you can come up with of across all the possible uh, input parameter spaces, it's gonna perform just as well as some other model. Uh, so uh, you might on a certain subset of problems, you might be doing well, better than everybody else. But if you look across all possible subsets of problems, you'll just be average. Uh, and if you think about us kind of humans kind of evolving our bias here, uh, when we started, we have been the optimal playing algorithm through our intelligence. But now the, the circumstances, the, the possible uh, space in which we are playing has changed. So whatever we thought is optimal, 
it's no longer going to be optimal. So what I'm, I'm trying to say is we shouldn't look for the silver or the bullet that's going to solve all our problems. This problem that we are experiencing right now with the biosphere is a problem that, yes, we'll solve it, but there's other problems that are going to appear that are not going to be solved the same way. We have to constantly kind of tweak and evolve our solutions to adapt to the new problems that we have. This is, I think, an intrinsic, I'm trying to come up with some way of, okay, these are some intrinsic rules of our reality in a way. Um, if you, yeah, if you, if you go through some of those books, all these are gonna be like, oh yeah, if you look at it from this perspective, these guys are observing this particular pattern. And this also, this pattern also appears from like this machine learning perspective. It also appears from a systems perspective. It also appears kind of from chaos theory perspective. All these, they, they kind of coalesce into like, oh, okay. So we seem to have these hard bounds on our, on our kind of reality. Um, uh, so Wei is asking, do you think idiocracy is a possible outcome? Uh, maybe. <laughs> uh, it, it's an interesting, uh, it, I'm not sure if it's gonna, it's gonna be, it's gonna be, if you think about it, kind of one of these equilibria. It might be that idiocracy for a while is gonna take hold <laughs> and the optimal strategy is to, everybody's gonna be an idiot, but then if everybody's in, is acting very poorly, maybe then people who are acting smartly are gonna kind of take over. It's gonna, hopefully we'll have, yeah, well, our environment is going to survive enough for us to pass through this bottleneck of just living on Earth and accessing just this limited amount of resources we have. Okay, I'm almost done here. So um, <laughs> this is kind of us kind of trying to move out to the stars. What are some ideas that I was thinking of? Uh, this one is kind of life has developed the, the ability to die. Uh, so um, the ability to die. So I was talking about this yesterday with some of you that were here was not always present in, in living life forms. So, I mean, they could die in the sense that, yes, a volcano would erupt and all the cells would be vaporized, but it wasn't like a, a, an E. coli cell would die on its own. It wouldn't have kind of processes that would say, okay, you divide only for a, a thousand times and after that you die. Uh, so I, I can't remember when this happened, probably a few billion years ago, uh, through the system of evolution and natural selection, the, the ability for organisms to die and release their resources for other organisms to pick up and grow and explore the diversity of the environment in new ways arose. And those organisms that learned how to die actually developed faster than organisms that didn't learn how to die. And the way I think about this is in, in our system, this is kind of 2010s or 20s, is how do we learn how to kind of pass on the wealth we have to future generations? Because if you are trying to say, okay, I'm gonna have everyone start from zero, our ecosystems cannot support everyone starting from zero all over again every time and reaching the same level of existence as us. So we have to learn how to pass the value that we generated to the next generation in an efficient way so they don't have to redo it. I don't know how to do it. Right? So this is kind of an open question. Um, but definitely, and this, I mean, this, uh, this problem I think was form, it originally formalized as how would developed nations reach the same level of wealth as um, let's say the developed nations. But I think it's much broader than that. It's like, how does the a new generation reach the same level of wealth as the old generation? And like a simple one would be like, well, you inherit the wealth of your parents. I mean, that sometimes works, but at scale, it's not everybody can inherit their wealth of the parents. So you have to somehow uh, distribute that wealth in some way. And I'll talk a bit about that too. So uh, the, the, I think a lot of times we, we, we've heard this idea of universal basic income. This is kind of promoted quite a lot nowadays. I, I was trying to look at how was it done before. Um, interestingly, the First Nations here in, in, in uh, I think it's on Vancouver or North Vancouver Island or on, on Ida Goai, they had other ways to share the wealth they had. So they had these potlatches, which I think potlatch means like literally give away. Uh, the, the Canadian government banned them uh, in the 1970s. I'm not exactly sure why. Uh, but it's an interesting way how a society kind of developed the ability to pass their wealth from one generation to another. Um, it would just give away their wealth. So the richest person was the person and the most powerful was the person who would give the most away. And then you, would, you can, can think about these kind of like a, a pulsating star. So you would, it would explode, the wealth would be kind of spread out, and then it would kind of recoalesce into another small set of individuals. Those individuals give it away again. You'd have this kind of this pumping action where through giving away the wealth, everybody kind of stay in, engaged in the community. Um, 
uh, I think in, in other instances, I think this was in Europe, when a new monarch would come, uh, there would be a debt jubilee, that's what it was called, where the, the, the monarch would just forgive everybody loans. So if, if you own money to the crown or something, they would just say, okay, all these loans are, or all the money you borrowed is forgiven and you can just keep it. Uh, so far, the, the modern market doesn't have a system through which we can recycle the wealth. The wealth kind of gets ice, uh, secluded in this higher ranking, uh, small set of individuals that have access to it. Um, and this is, this is where I, I think about it slightly differently. Uh, a lot of, uh, I, I see, and this is, this is again emotions that are driving our, our perspective on what is good to do in reality. So a lot of us, uh, and this is me too, and I was thinking about money, I was like, okay, I'm going to accumulate money. And the next thought I was like, what am I going to spend it on? And a lot of times we spend it on, on things that are kind of immediately benefiting me. And I think as, as you are, as I'm reaching a point where I'm like, okay, I've, I'm accumulating money, I can see I accumulated it. I don't really care about how I'm going to consume it. I care more about how I'm going to allocate it to change my environment so that it stays valuable to me. Um, and this, it, it, I looked at Bill Gates and Bill Gates is one of these guys that is trying to give away his money, but he's making money faster than he can give it away. And he, he was talking about how it's very hard to give money away effectively, to try to measure, have a metric that you say, okay, I want to improve this thing. So I'm going to give money away so that this particular metric is going to be improved. And the market, this is where I'm thinking like the market is really good at actually creating a, a, a driving function and driving up that. So if you have a, a price, the price is going to encapsulate the fact that it's desirable, then you can drive that on the desire curve. If you give money over randomly in charity, you, you have no idea what you're going to, what, what is that, what's the particular parameter you're going to be trying to improve. Uh, it's not an easy thing. And um, this next plot, I was looking at how much money the wealthiest individuals in the world have versus how much money governments allocate. Because the, if you look at the, the richest people here, um, they, in my mind, they don't have as much impact into the world as some government employee who now allocates money to, I don't know, social security or something. And this is this kind of me looking at different amounts of, so Jeff Bezos, I, I should have updated this because Elon Musk now is richer, so whatever. But it, it's, it's not, it doesn't, it doesn't change much. But the, the US budget is, uh, this is in billions, uh, over, then this is over 40 years. So, because I was thinking like, okay, so these guys made their, wealth in over the last 30 years or something. So if you look at those budgets, and this is an engineer, their entire, <laughs> you make, I don't know, $4 million or something over your lifetime. Uh, but these guys are not in the, the, the impact on how they allocate resources in, 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 in direct money is not anywhere close to the impact that the government's allocation of resources is. So there's a lot, I think there's a lot to say about trying to educate the government employees or not to educate, inform them on how to allocate money better. Because if you only look at the rich people and you try to say, oh yeah, this uh, Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos are not using their money well. Like even if those guys were using their money in the 100% effective way, optimal way for uh, reducing inequality, it would be, it would make like be a drop in the bucket compared to how much money the governments are pushing around. And this is where Bill Gates was saying like, look, if I, I donate all my money to, I don't know, cure some disease, it's not enough because if you look at the NIH budget, in, in three years, the budget of NIH has covered all my, everything I've accumulated in all my life. So I think there's a lot to be said about kind of the role of government, kind of us as engineers, as us as technocrats in a way, kind of trying to inform the decision process to align it better with kind of the maintenance of and this and capturing of the values in the market or in, in our ecosystem. This is a book that I really like because I, I, I'm always looking at different perspectives because I, I feel like our, the perspective of whatever we call diversity in the Western world, I think it's very homogeneous. homogeneous. So we don't have enough perspective, enough diversity. I mean, there's, there's a EDI that we, you know, equity, diversity and inclusion that we have, but I think that's very, very limited. I always want to kind of see a, how did people use to this in different societies and what were they valuing versus what are they not valuing? This is a book, um, this guy, David Friedman, he was actually a physicist. He finished a physics undergrad, and he's actually the son of uh, that other guy, Friedman, uh, that I was talking about when I talked about the pencil, the economist. Mm -hmm. So he's yeah, Milton Friedman. He's the son of Milton Friedman, and he has a book on different legal systems. And he talks about you can see here all these different legal systems. Pirates had a system too of how they would value things. 
Um, and just by, by, and this is a very short book, I think it's 150 pages. And you can see how they pers pursued what was valuable to them. Maybe by looking at this diverse set of opinions, you, you can maybe come up with some set of, well, this might work for us or not. Before we move on, uh, yeah. just a single individual with a, an amount of resources like Bill Gates or Elon yeah, Musk yeah. or whatever. Like, yes, I agree, governments have more dollar amount, but not more dollar amount per person, right? Like, yes, they're, they're organizing how things are moved around, but you're organizing how, you know, how much social security is moved around on. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna say this, Americans. just wanna say, uh, I think you're the US education. defense system, yeah. or whatever, the US military spent $60 billion in oh. one year in Afghanistan oh. for air conditioning. Oh yeah, no, I'm just so, saying, I, I just wanted to point out that like- that's, To me, it's like, okay, so Bill, Elon Musk now has 200 billion. So US military is gonna spend in three years on air conditioning, yeah. the wealth of Elon Musk. Sure, so but how then, much- Again, on how many individuals, right? Uh, like like there's, there, there's just a normalization that I- Oh, so, okay, there. yeah. The, like, I'm not saying like that's an effective use of money. I'm just trying to say like, I don't know if it's fair to compare the amount of money the entire U.S. government uses on anything compared to the wealth of an individual. I agree that uh, yeah, yeah, it's important that we for for if you look at the individuals per, per person, yeah, right. if you look at per person. What I yeah. think is like if we want to change the if you want our to system, the world, yeah, yeah, the world, it's these Maybe guys can't do much. Money away, do anything. Yeah. yeah, and no, it's, and it's a, one of these things. If we want to maintain our biosphere diversity, like the, an the individual can't do that. On what the is it? The the Fashion industry, I think, is spending four hundred eighty billion dollars. Or it's not the fashion; it's the makeup industry. A year. I'm like, okay. So if you want to change something, you can look at that kind of. Okay. To me, kind of. I mean, you can change these guys too. But there's the the spectrum. There's many thousands of dimensions that you can operate on, and you are trying to tweak one of them. Uh, and I, I mean, you can push on these. I'm just saying, like, you can keep doing this too, but. I think there's, you probably want to spend way more resources on trying to understand how to modify sure. I think the reason why so many people want to like, you know, egg on Elon Musk or, or Jeff Bezos is because of how, like you said, how kind of uh, non-uniformly distributed value this is, is. Remember how I was talking about how we have this counting manifold? Mm -hmm. That idea of this is not equitable yes. has evolved over millions of years to make our society work at the scale of I know, 100 to 1,000 people. And this is like a, an emotion that I feel too. Mm -hmm. That is not equitable. But as soon as I feel like that, I'm like, okay, on, on which, what are the boundaries of my system on which is an engineer that is not equitable? If I operate in a 7 billion people environment mm -hmm. and this emotion that I feel was developed when I was operating in a, I mean, I'm not saying this is right. I'm just saying like that mapping of my emotion to the reality, I don't think it's, it's a valid, right. a valid if, approach. If you're trying to use value to affect exactly, right. and I think we have to kind of step back and realize that our emotion and we are on this cognitive manifold. We'll have to be like, okay, whatever I do, I'm stuck on it. So mm -hmm. I have to be very careful that I'm not kind of operating in a non. I mean, you have to step back, and this is why I'm looking at these other guys. Mm -hmm. Okay, how did they value things? Mm -hmm. I want to kind of move out a bit of that mm -hmm. manifold and be like, okay, how do things operate differently? Um, we'll see how things are. You know, like the amount of money that like the U.S. government has control over, over, like in comparison with the amount of money that you know used to lobby the U.S. Congress is like really small. So maybe the most effective piece of money for Bill Gates is actually just by Congress. Oh yeah. So you can. I mean, the, the other thing is U.S. So okay, there's a U.S. has a very good, uh, you would say, um, it's still a good journalist like freedom of the press. So there's a lot of information that's being moved around. And you can see, okay, yeah, Bill Gates is the richest or whoever is nowadays. But um, in the rest of the world, things are not as transparent. And you don't realize that actually in, in probably uh, the prince of Saudi Arabia is actually probably the wealthiest person in the world. And he's probably like, if you look at the richest, the wealthiest market cap company right now, it's Armco, right. which is the Saudi Arabian uh, uh, oil company. And that's owned by... so. We'll have, we'll, you have different tiers of rich people. And the fact that you see one tier being, oh, this is the richest person, it probably means that you probably don't see the other people that are much richer than them because our, our, uh, there's not enough transparency in our, in our kind of social system. And I, uh, at the end, I'll have a slide. So I looked at the Pareto distribution of 
how many wealthy individuals are in there in the United States? Kind of, we can go into but that. I think what you're saying is a good point. Like, if you want to affect change, there's bigger systems than individuals that you can operate. I, on. I don't think that forgives individuals. It's only money. <laughs> I, 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 and it's, I mean, it, it's forgive. And again, every time I think about it, I'm like, where, how did this emotions I feel evolve? Yeah. And I mean, it might be still good. I have no idea. It might be that this is actually an optimal emotion to apply in this particular environment. And there's a lot of research on this. This is Daniel Kahneman. I don't know how many of you guys read the Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow. It's a book that I bought a few copies of it and gave it to all my friends. Like, hey, this is a fundamental book that you need to understand to understand your behavior. There's all types of bias, cognitive biases. The one that kind of really sticks out to me is kind of this halo and horns effect. The halo effect is when you see a virtuoso pianist play, you assign to them the ability to play the piano. You kind of translate it to their ability to uh, do complex analysis really well in mathematics. Or if they're really good at complex analysis, you'll also think like, oh yeah, they'll also be very good at skateboarding or something. So the, your, your brain has a way to a heuristic in which when it tries to understand the world rapidly, it just assigns the same abilities you have in one domain to some other domain. And that kind of, it, it simplifies the world and how you understand the world. The horns effect is the exact opposite. If you think that somebody is very bad at something, you assign the fact that they're bad at something to other things too. So if you say, oh yeah, this person is very selfish. Now they must be also very poor at assign, like, I don't know, uh, understanding something else. That's also a bias, a heuristic that your brain uses to understand the world. And every time I'm looking at, uh, I was trying to, a lot of times when I see these, a lot of great contributors to our understanding of the world are eccentric. So they are fairly poorly understood. And you, because you see them as eccentric, you either say, oh, it's the halo effect or the horns effect that you assign to them. And this is, this is I thought is a really cool one. The Cavendish, the guy who turned yeah, the, yeah. so I, I, did I tell you, yeah, I told you, you guys you about this. Yeah. So this was, this was the quote. So Cavendish was a very eccentric person. He was a, he hated, I think, I guess he had agoraphobia. He didn't have agoraphobia. He would actually go to parties, but he would kind of be sitting in a room and if you wanted to talk to him, you'd have to enter the room and just talk to the window as if he was not there. And he would kind of listen to you and he would be okay with it. But if you talk to him directly, you'd just be Wait. scared and afraid and he would be really apprehensive about it. And uh, you guys can read this. So some fan went to his front door and when Kevin just opened the door, this fan was just so happy that he could see him. Kevin just kind of just spooked and he ran into the forest and he didn't come back until kind of late in the evening. <laughs> I mean, I think his servants had to go find him in the forest. <laughs> um, but you can, you can think about the other people that are very eccentric and it's, it's hard to kind of understand their perspective and you have to actually improve their, this is kind of, yeah, it's the, the diversity of opinion. You have to allow the diversity of opinion to exist. Uh, and this is kind of me kind of looking at what I call planetary justice. So instead of social justice, uh, this is a term that I like because it's, it's plan, it means not only kind of justice on, on a, it has a few different dimensions. So it's, you look at the, the entities you apply the justice to, it's not only humans, uh, but also across time. So you have to think about the kind of at a, at a larger scale. Uh, so we have, as humans, we apply our concept that the lifetime of a human scale, but if you're a tree, you have to think about this on, on the scale of hundreds of years or not. And I'm thinking that if you want to maintain the diversity in the ecosystem, you want to be able to think about these things at a, at a much larger scale. And this is kind of like, we want to cover this entire area, not just kind of this little tiny spot here when you think about what you think it's equitable. And as a human, you, our emotions have developed to capture what we think is equitable for humans, but we have to expand that. And I have no idea how you do it and you might do it poorly. Uh, we'll see. Of like you shouldn't be screwing over iguanas. Or, or elephants or trees or something. Uh, another one that I, so these are kind of tools that I'm trying to use to understand how to manipulate my cognition to kind of, a breakthrough of that manifold. Uh, a lot of the time, so I, I think there's a, a big emphasis a lot of times when I talk to people about being empathic and understanding how other feel. Uh, and uh, the, this is a book that behaved the biology of humans or, or at our best and worst behave in our worst times by Sapolsky. And I put it in the reading list for in physics. I thought this was really good the capture of our, our neural science processes. Um, so a lot of times empathy, what causes a lot, I think the, the theory is we have these mirror neurons that when you see someone do something, your, your motor system and not only your motor system, you, you, you kind of reenact what they're doing. So if somebody feels pain, you actually feel their pain and there's actually a, a response of flight or fright response in yourself. 
that mimics their response and you feel what they feel. And this is, I think, what the, the basic definition of empathy is. The problem with that is that you get kind of paralyzed by fear and you can no longer, or maybe you have like tunnel vision and you no longer can find the optimal solution for them. And then the Buddhists were realized this and they, they have this term like compassion where you have to transcend your empathy, where you have to kind of go beyond the paralysis or the narrowing in, in that fear induces or kind of the pain induces in you. You kind of detach yourself, whatever caused that pain and look at the, the, the problem at large. This is where I'm thinking like, okay, I, I'm sometimes feel overwhelmed about, well, we'll never save our, uh, our ecosystem. We are just gonna destroy it. And this fear, this kind of, it's kind of, I'm resonating, I'm empathizing with our inside environment, but the way to move forward, you have to kind of transcend and be like, okay, that's what it is, you know, kind of slow down. How can I solve things? What can I, what are the levers that I can move and how can I move them to make things work? But I think a lot of people focus on empathy too much and you need to kind of push beyond that. Um, and it's, I, don't, I mean, I don't know how many of you knew about this difference in empathy and compassion. You, you had that in your mind. Just kind of try to seed some ideas here. Okay, back to this, hopefully this is the last slide or more or less of the, we need to find some value function that kind of we can incorporate in our market value to account for these, uh, these things that are outside of our system. And if we optimize that using the market, we can probably get out of the, the kind of problems we are starting to see that we are facing. I've not, so I'm, I'm fairly certain there is not a single value function. This value function is gonna have to change as we develop more and more. I don't know if there is one though. Um, there's all kinds of ethical dilemmas that I think are gonna arise. So we might find a value function that, but that's gonna restrict our freedoms a lot. So what are the, is it ethical to restrict somebody's freedoms to achieve some other kind of goal? Uh, yeah, the, the, it, I'm not sure if the ends justify the means. This is, we still have to establish that. But in the end kind of, if you want the monetary value that you have to keep going, this kind of me kind of, this is my last point. Uh, at some point I realized that being wealthy is not really having money. It's just having value in the environment that you live in. And that a lot of times is being hid, hidden by having mon monetary wealth. You'll have a very poor environment and you have a lot of monetary wealth or you could be rich, you're living in a rich environment where you have not a lot of monetary wealth and you're not appreciating how much wealth you actually have. Um, yeah, so I, this is, uh, okay, two more slides. So. One is that to this point, exactly you're saying like um, how we, we change our perspectives and you guys have heard of this. So I'm gonna read there. So alchemists in the 1600s, they were looking for how to transmute uh, lead into gold. And then once we know how to transmute lead into gold in the 1930s and 40s, when we understand nuclear fusion and fission, we no longer care about transmuting lead into gold because the perspective we have on our reality is so much richer that that wealth that you could accumulate through getting more gold no longer makes sense. So it might be that, you know, in a hundred years from now, we'll have a new perspective on reality that is gonna be saying like, look, whatever you thought a Ferrari car is gonna bring you in happiness has no relationship to the, the richness of reality. And reality is way, way, way stranger than we can imagine. Every time I, something new happens, I'm like, holy smokes, nobody, like, in, if you look at science fiction novels from the 1930s, you see how obsolete they were in their imagination. And this is it. So this is the last slide. So uh, remember money is a great servant, but a very bad uh, master. And yeah, this is uh, when shot well, talking about how technology nobody <laughs> can tell how it's gonna go. So I have some more appendix slides, but this is it. And maybe it gave you some perspective on why I think that yeah, keeping your money in the market might still be the best way to go about it. I think if the market disappears, I don't know where you can keep your wealth in that's still valuable because most of the value, we, the, the wealth we have is reflected in the underlying market value. Or the only way we can increase that is if we incorporate more of our ecosystems in our market value system. Okay, I'm done. Sorry, guys. This was, I'm realizing that uh, I went over time by a lot. So thank you very much for sticking around. Uh, <laughs> no worries. Uh, the, yeah, the reading what you guys think is probably the more important part. Um, then, uh, yeah, this is, okay, this is one of the one where I was, if you use the Pareto distribution and you look at the wealth across the United States, um, and I think this is a population, this is done by this guy at Thorp. If you want to try to estimate how many billionaires are in the United States, and you use this 80-20 uh, rule more or less, and, and you look at, okay, what's the market value and 
you spread across this kind of, there's probably about 400 people that have more than, or yeah, 1200 people that have more than a billion dollars in the United States. These numbers, you can't really get them. Uh, Forbes has a, a list and everybody's like, oh, you're on the richest person on Forbes list. I'm like, well, that's the people you know of. There's others that you don't know of. Um, okay. We, yeah, I'm not gonna go into more, but yeah, so that, that, that was it. And just to double check, both slide decks are available where? Uh, I'll, I'll just put them on, I'll put them on in Discord. I can send you an email and maybe I'll put them on YouTube. So I'll, I'll make the videos available on YouTube and I'll put yeah, them- Yeah, you said the, the videos are on YouTube, but just so we can go and click uh, okay. your- Yeah, you can go, exactly, go to the source. Uh, all right, guys, sorry for-